Hello, I'm Raman Rook, and today I will be collabing with my good friend, Sabbath. Hello everyone, this is Sabbath, also known as Mel Sabath, or just Mel. I've been part of the 3v3 scene since November, I've hit S rank in the first two seasons for PC teams, and I, alongside Raman and Risa, make up the 3v3 team Reap and Sow. I have experience in teaching players the game mode, what builds work, as well as participating in 3v3 workshops as a coach. You might be wondering why you should try 3v3s. Personally, I find 3v3 to be a lot more engaging than the current state of 1v1, and I love being able to game with my friends in a team environment. While it's not a perfect game mode, I do think the teamwork aspect of it becomes extremely satisfying and unifying, and you're able to express yourself as both individuals and as a team. Our hopes for this video is to give a broad overview on how to effectively play 3v3s in a coordinated environment. As such, we will not go super in-depth on the mechanics of PvP. In this game mode, the team with the most points at the end of the match wins. Points are distributed roughly as follows. Every AC is worth approximately 100 points, plus an additional 10 points for the killing blow. Points are roughly distributed to team members based on damage dealt, rounded down, with the highest scoring player on the winning team being considered the MVP. This MVP system is a little weird, and sadly it's yet to be precisely data mined, but the leading theory of it is that the points that the kill leader accumulates from damaging enemies is increased by 50%, while points accumulated from damaging the MVP themselves is increased by 33%. Because of this, killing the MVP should always be on the back of your mind, as it's how you can obtain a point advantage, even if both teams have the same amount of kills. Now that we know how point scoring works, let's go over how to actually win the match. A match can be broken into three distinct phases, the early game, mid game, and end game. Each phase has its own strategy that we will cover. The early game roughly includes the start of the match and up to the first team fight. At this point in the game, Teams are vying for positional advantage as well as stagger and AP advantage. This is commonly referred to as neutral play. During neutral play, a team will seek to build up chip with missiles or manually aimed shoulder weapons. Usually, the team with the most missiles will want to keep neutral play going until they have a sizable advantage, while aggressive teams will use cover to help close the distance and dive on to an easy target. Cover play in general is crucial to strong neutral play as it can be used by all players to reduce chip damage. Once the first team fight has occurred, we move on to the mid game, which is where the majority of the match will take place and is arguably the most important part of the game. From here, several strategies can be found, but we'll be going over the most important ones. An enemy is considered post terminal when their terminal armor has expired and they are on one AP left. It is crucial as a team to ensure this person is dealt with appropriately. The obvious means is to just kill them as soon as possible with whatever weapon you have or even a body bump, but there is another strategy to this known as spawn cycling. Spawn cycling is the strategy of deliberately keeping a lone post terminal enemy alive for a period of time and avoiding taking fire from them. While doing this, your team needs to try looking around the map and diving enemies that may have spawned alone such that the spawn cycle can continue. The idea behind this is such that when the rest of their team spawns, said lone enemy can be finished off and will force their team into a numbers disadvantage for ideally the rest of the game. If done right, your team can snowball their point lead out of control. If you do spawn in alone, there are a few ways to prevent your opponents from spawn cycling. First, you could try to hide so that you can remain safe until the rest of your team respawns and you are all together. If you are spotted, however, you can either attempt to run away and possibly force them to overextend into a just respawn team, or trade lives so when your team respawns, they have the opportunity to possibly start their own spawn cycle. Mid game is where most of the points during a match will be gained. Proper spawn cycling will allow you to have a lead so big that your opponents can never close it. In the event that the match is close towards the end of the game, the end game can occur. End game is generally the shortest phase of a game, often less than 30 seconds, but it is still incredibly nuanced. Your approach to the end game will depend on which team is winning, where everyone is, what map you're on, and what team composition you have. If you're winning and are not detected by the enemy, purge all weapons and play for time. 
whether that be hiding or actively running from them. This will guarantee that you and your team will keep your point lead and secure the game. However, if this is not possible or your team is losing, play for kills. This is where communicating to your team on what players are post-terminal and where enemies are on the map becomes extremely crucial. Keep in mind, it is a very tense situation, so do your best to remain calm. Otherwise, you may either talk over your teammates, make the wrong call, or just have overall miscommunication. And remember, terminal armor lasts about 5 seconds, so if you are not on terminal armor by the last 5 seconds, you are pretty much safe. Let's talk about what makes good communication in 3v3s. One of the most important things to coordinate with your team is timing punishes. You need to be able to say, I can hear shot, LCD, stagger, and also have someone confirm that if your target is staggered, that they will be punished. If someone calls that they have punish, you should let them punish first before you try to add your own punish. Two. I can hear shot him. Nice, good trade. Okay. It's also important to recognize who is targeting who in the game. Thankfully, there's a simple way of knowing this. By the side of a player's emblem, there will be up to three lights. How many lights there are shows how many people are targeting them. If there are no lights, then no one is targeting them. You can use this information to ensure not only what player your team is focusing on diving, but it'll also give you the cue of when you're being targeted. If two or more people are locked onto you, it's rarely a bad idea to tell your team that you're looking to either reposition or trade such that your team can capitalize on the fact they're not being targeted. All right, so you've picked a target to focus on. Now what? Well, from experience with my own threes team, there are a few ways we can coordinate when and how to dive on someone. We usually start by taking stock of where all three opposing players are, and then we call out our own positions on the map. And after we are all aware of each other's positions, we relay the actual distance we are from the target. This helps ensure that no one is lagging behind or being too aggressive. I'm running right I'm now. diving too. You're a little far, you're a little far. I'm going right, to. I'm right by you, just, I'm right by you go. now, Risa. I'm right by you, Risa. On two. Just send it. Send it. Yeah, we got the trade at least. Oh, I should also point out that, yes, we do have our own positional callouts for every major map played in teams. While they're not mandatory for a team to be strong, they do help, and I personally recommend coming up with your own positions for a map as a team. Let's also talk about spawn tracking. We did briefly mention this previously, about how keeping someone alive to desync spawns is a powerful strategy, but it goes beyond just that. It's also very important to communicate to your team whether or not there's a numbers advantage, how soon a down player will respawn, and if someone's the only healthy member on their team, reminding them that they will soon be alone and should probably prepare for that. That might seem like obvious stuff, but the obvious can be easily forgotten in the heat of battle. I got him, okay, I got him. Alone, him. You will be alone in a bit. I got the trade, I got the trade. Don't, yeah, don't, don't engage. Just don't, don't engage. engage, don't engage, don't engage. For us. I'm here. Pro tip, if you are dead, you should be communicating. Take the time to communicate who is post-terminal, who is close to dead, who is dead, who is responding, etc. Lastly, let's go over some common mistakes so you know what not to do. First up is kicking. Kicking is a quintessential part of singles, but in teams it's used much more sparingly. If you try using kicks as a stagger punish, like how you might in singles, you're just gonna knock the enemy away from your allies and make them miss their punish. Instead, kicking is generally used to either lock down someone trying to assault boost away, or to keep someone stunned after a stagger punish has already occurred. Diving in alone. If you just respawn and your teammates are dead, the last thing you should try to do is run into the enemy team alone and die. Even if you are trying to confirm a kill on someone who is post-term, exposing yourself to danger while your allies are dead is asking to be spawn cycled. We've talked a lot about terminal armor in this video, so I do want to clear the air. Yes, 
Terminal armor is unfortunately mandatory for competitive teams. I'll explain it more in detail in the next video, but long story short, terminal armor guarantees value while the other core expansions don't. Plus, Pulse Armor's durability was designed for 1v1s in mind instead of teams, so even a well-timed Pulse Armor will be whittled away in seconds and you're just gonna get staggered again anyways. Remember to clean up people who are post-terminal, but don't overcommit to it. The more time you are looking at someone with terminal armor, the less value you create for your allies. Be evasive if you term someone. Make a mental note of where they are and do your best to create value. It's not the end of the world if you lose track of a pulse term player, so long as you communicate that to your team. Just make sure you don't tunnel vision and you should be okay. That wraps it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed and if you have any questions, please leave a comment or join the linked discord server below. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for part 2 on Sabbath's channel.